I get started, um, the, the talk is called Building a Pediatric Simulation Program, a Toolkit. And the, the concept I thought that would be worth going through is kind of talking a little bit about um, our successes and failures uh, over the last 10 years or so at Boston Children's. Uh, from when we started, we really are sort of at our 10-year anniversary. Uh, and in looking back, I think there were some real lessons learned. Uh, and uh, when I thought about those, it almost felt like we had created a bit of a toolkit uh, that we adhere to quite uh, strongly um, as we move forward in, in building the program uh, larger and larger. So um, I hope to just share that with you, and uh, I'll spend about 30 or 35 minutes or so um, talking, and then I would like to open up to some questions and some discussion uh, that I know Mark uh, and Taylor will uh, moderate. So I got to start by thanking my crew here at Boston Children's and the simulator program. Uh, Laura, Laura Soares, uh, as she is now known, uh, is the program administrator. Uh, Carson Hicks is our educator, and uh, Megan, uh, my associate director, Catherine Allen, our executive directors, uh, Jeff Burns and Patty Hickey, uh, as well as our very talented technical staff, uh, Gavin Hayes and Caitlin Parker. Uh, as well as uh, Katie Flynn, Katie Fitzpatrick, uh, Nicole Stenquist, and Jocelyn Noitz, who's joining us uh, from Auckland, New Zealand. We've had an ongoing relationship uh, with that, the Starship Hospital there, and we're excited to have Jocelyn as our International Simulation Fellow uh, currently. I have no disclosures. So I thought I'd start by this note uh, that really struck us about 10 years ago uh, and has really kind of formed a, a North Star for us. Uh, and that is that um, we are, or at least till recently, the only high stakes industry uh, that does not practice prior to game time. And so when you think about uh, other high stake industries like nuclear power, the airline industry, uh, and even for us, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, for example, uh, they practice time and time again before, so to speak, game time or the actual performance. And the time that you're actually seeing uh, the Symphony Orchestra, for example, uh, is the last time they're playing that song, not the first time. Uh, and it only makes good sense that they would rehearse time and time again uh, before they would actually um, perform. Same is true of uh, Olympic athletes, uh, who spend more time practicing than obviously uh, performing and uh, competing. So the question became, can we match the same training standards of other high stakes industries? And of course, the answer uh, is we should. Uh, and I think now the exciting answer that we can all give is that um, we can start to match the same training standards, this idea of deliberative practice and rehearsal. The question is, how do we develop programs that can do this accurately, efficiently, effectively, uh, and in a sustainable fashion? So the solution, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, is realistic simulation-based training, and I've added this idea of high-quality facilitation. I can't stress enough, and, I, and again, I'm looking at the list of folks who have joined us today, I know you feel the same, that it's not so much what is being delivered, uh, but who is delivering it, uh, and the quality of those, of those facilitators and instructors that can make or break a program. So what we're really looking for is frequent opportunities for deliberative practice in an accessible, safe, and structured environment, and of course, that's going to be very much determined by the people who deliver it, uh, and of course, far from patient harm, which is one of the cornerstones of simulation-based training. I thought I would highlight also um, how we started to think about pediatric simulation in particular and related specifically to the nuances of pedia inherent in pediatrics that really make it uh, very well suited for simulation-based training. And it's no surprise to me how quickly pediatric simulation has risen within uh, the field, uh, so much so that now, of course, there is this society. But in addition, there are very successful consortiums research consortiums like the Inspire Network, uh, which has been tremendously successful, and so on. And I think that these speak to the need uh, within pediatrics and perinatal medicine for simulation-based training. And this has to do with uh, several needs, and that is to practice to proficiency far from, ha far from harm to children and infants. Uh, the idea of practicing on children has always been incongruent for many, and so the idea that we can practice prior uh, almost a see one, simulate one, then uh, do one and teach one changes the apprenticeship model using simulation. The idea of um, achieving optimal volume outcome relationships in a setting uh, where you're looking at high acuity, low frequency events, and this is very typical of pediatrics 
in some ways the pediatric training paradox has to do with the idea that pediatrics itself, most children are well, which is a good marker of child health. The problem is that from a training standpoint, getting that kind of volume uh, of the lo relatively low frequency events to be able to have the outcomes we all desire can be very difficult. And so um, the, the supplementation via simulation is very well suited. The need to mitigate inherent time and chance in pediatric training, as we all know, depending on what rotation a trainee is on at what time of the year, uh, can really affect the, the type of profile of patients they might experience. If you're in the intensive care unit during the winter month, for example, here in Boston, you'll see lots of bronchiolitis. Uh, but if you're there in a summer month, you might see perioperative patients in the ICU. And so it really varies. So how do you mitigate that? And simulation is well suited. You need to overcome training limitations re related to work hour restrictions, as well as in pediatrics, particularly societal expectations for senior level involvement, this idea that we're expanding and extending the queue between the patient and the trainee more and more uh, as there's more and more redundancy within the system. So how do you shorten that queue? How do you create autonomy? And how do you create direct relationships uh, for the trainee with the quote unquote patient? Well, simulation is a way at least to get them uh, to the, get them on the ground uh, running. And finally, this idea of training amidst this patient-doctor-parent triad uh, really um, begs the question of optimizing relational skills training using simulation-based methodologies um, in order to reinforce family-centered care. So these are all kind of the nuances in pediatrics that we have to pay attention to uh, as we develop simulation-based training programs, but also I think what is fueling uh, this very rapid growth within our field. So for us, um, we started about 10 years ago, and we asked the question, how do we best prepare for low-frequency, high-risk events in pediatrics? And that's when we started to develop the simulation center as an on-site center within the hospital itself. And I'll show you some uh, more information around that. Broadly, then, about three years later, we asked a more refined question, which was, how do we best prepare busy practitioners for low-frequency, high-risk events? And so we became very focused, and I think some of this has to do with me being a clinician myself, but this idea that you can create lots of technology in simulation, but if you can't get the practitioner to the simulator, uh, you really do not have a sustainable model of training. And so that's when the mobile carts started to develop for us, and uh, we began building um, carts to make their way around the hospital to bring simulation close to the, to the uh, um, um, places where practitioners uh, were delivering care. And then finally, um, we asked the question again, how do you, just sort of a further iteration, which was how do we best prepare busy practitioners to deliver safe, efficient, and affordable care to children and their families? And this really prompted us to develop the program fully and expand it to include all of the different training components uh, throughout the hospital. I'm not gonna go into the details of our mission statement, um, but instead just to highlight really the first uh, bullet point here which has really become our mantra within the program, and that is um, we really see simulation-based training as a way to recruit, train, and retain high-quality staff within the hospital. And if you think about it, if you can keep high-quality people uh, who have been here a long period of time, understand the system well, and are quite experienced and talented, in some ways that's your best patient safety initiative. And so we have really formed our simulation-based training programs across the expertise gradient with this concept in mind. We also focus on standardization and dissemination of team training, both uh, here within the hospital as well as locally, nationally, and internationally. We spent lots of time developing international simulation centers using a lot of the processes that I'm going to develop, describe to you, uh, and then also became a, a focus for relational communication training and for quality improvement. So here is the story of our program in one slide. Uh, so this is the last 10 years. We started as a simulator itself, and I use that term very carefully, uh, in 2002, which was delivering um, basically the ability to do resuscitation training drills uh, in two ICUs, and that's why the courses in 2002 were two of those. Um, so that was the advent of bringing a simulator into the hospital. That was the key element that occurred in 2002. In 2005, uh, a key element in our growth was identifying a specific um, individual who was going to uh, help lead the simulation efforts for the hospital. Prior to that, there was a technician uh, who was delivering the simulators uh, into each of these environments, but there wasn't someone who had created this as an academic uh, career path for them, and it was in 2005 that that started. 
And in 2009 or so uh, is when we uh, attained hospital funding uh, for the simulator program. So our funding initially was heavily loaded uh, towards philanthropic donations. Uh, and then in around 2008, 2009, we pivoted uh, based on really the success and the quality of the program, the hospital uh, started to fund it as a line item, budget item. And uh, you can see the growth following that in 2009. Uh, here are our FTEs, uh, just to give people a bit of an historical perspective. Uh, people, very often I'll talk about our program in 2012, uh, but what we fail to realize is how long it took us to get there. Uh, and we started really with one FTE, uh, and that was the case for about two and a half years or three years when we first started. Uh, and that was a technician predominantly and kind of a program manager. And then we added a uh, second technician in 2004. And we really were running with two technicians for almost six years uh, and then started to add uh, a couple more. And then when we obtained hospital funding, we were able to expand the program uh, a little bit more broadly, bringing educators and training coordinators in uh, as well. So this is a little bit of our history in terms of our growth, but also a little of the budgetary components uh, and where this all came from. This is who we're currently delivering simulation to in the hospital. So nearly um, every division and department, and of those, uh, several different um, programs exist uh, within the departments themselves. Um, so with this growth in mind and this kind of um, uh, wide spectrum of delivery of the resource, um, it took me uh, back a little bit to think contextually, what was it that led to this kind of growth um, and what have been the basic principles that we have um, held to very carefully that we felt were uh, wins for us. We call these our guiding principles, and this is going to form the toolkit that I'll talk about. One is that the program is applicable and founded on adult learning principles. Two is that it's high quality, and I'm going to talk about the importance of trained faculty. Three is that you have to have structured processes in, in place, um, particularly as it relates to uh, curriculum development uh, all the way through faculty, faculty development. Uh, realism, I'll talk, show you some examples of how you have to achieve really high degrees of realism for um, more senior level practitioners, uh, but not so uh, necessarily for more junior trainees and medical students and nursing students. Has to be accessible and part of the institutional fabric. Has to be relevant and aligned with institutional initiatives, and I'll show you some examples of that, and we think that is the major thrust for sustainability. Has to be collaborative. Uh, and we feel that um, through some of these um, strategies that I'll show you, um, we've been able to form a very strong community of educators uh, with a shared central resource. And that's been absolutely critical uh, to obtain buy-in of stakeholders and shareholders. And finally, of course, research and the idea of studying and proving our own processes. And I'll talk very briefly at the end of how to look at simulation as what's called a disruptive technology in, in industrial and in sort of um, organizational learning terms. and and industry terms, and I'll, I'll introduce you guys to that a little bit towards the end of the talk. Let's just talk about applicability and the importance of adult learning principles. And I put this number one because it really is the foundation upon why, which all of the rest is, is built. So what we're doing is we're leveraging adult learning and the idea that adults learn best um, through some version of experience. Uh, and what I mean by that is that somewhere on the experience spectrum, so that it may be that they um, want to hear about an experience versus actually have it, uh, but somehow this engaging sort of emotionally laden event um, can be very effective. And of course, um, the yang to that ying uh, is the idea of the implications of debriefing on this uh, very important leveraging of adult learning and how these have to happen hand in hand to create a successful program. So. This is um, kind of all of adult learning principles in one slide, um, but it is something we think about a lot in our own program. So this is time and proficiency. And you can see here that for all of us in our professional lives, uh, we go through this kind of curve. Uh, and I'll just walk you through it. So point number one on this curve is what I call unconscious incompetence. And so that is um, not knowing what you don't know. And in some ways, if many of you are thinking, well, that's a pretty good time in my life, well, you're right because that's kind of ignorance is bliss, uh, and um, it doesn't get better than that in many ways. The second step of this is what I call uh, conscious incompetence. So this is when we realize for the first time what we don't know, and we become conscious of it and aware of it. Uh, and as a result, it can be a little unsettling, uh, but at the same time, I think it's the most exciting time in our careers because we're actually realizing for the first time what we can learn. The third phase of this curve is conscious competence. And here you can see 
Uh, you're thinking about everything you do, uh, but you're doing it well, but you're very conscious of every step of it. It's almost like when you first rode a bike and you're thinking stepwise uh, every time you get on it. This fourth phase I put in red because I think that this is probably the most dangerous part of all of our careers, and this is unconscious competence. So this is not thinking about what you do anymore. It's uh, kind of becoming kind of an autopilot. And we know from a human factor standpoint that this is a very dangerous part of our, our lives because we do. We stop thinking about what we're doing deeply, and we start to even believe that we can multitask. And as we all know, we're seeing more and more data that suggests that uh, human beings are very um, uh, poorly suited for multitasking. So simulation um, from an adult learning standpoint is really the ability on demand to put people back on the steep edge of their learning curve, to make them either consciously incompetent or at least consciously competent again, to have them think deeply uh, about what they're doing that they typically do on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is done by very sharply creating scenarios and debriefings for that matter that keep the learner on the edge of their learning curve, not over it, so not over the cliff, but right on it. Uh, and uh, this has a lot to do with how scenarios are designed very methodically uh, and debriefed for that matter. Of course, the idea of Kolb learning cycles is becoming very well known within simulation because David Kolb's work maps so beautifully onto the simulation experience. And we think about this um, in terms of curriculum development because we want to fully leverage the Kolb learning cycle, so developing curricula that have within them simulations, but more broadly roll out a Kolb learning cycle will fully leverage uh, the technology and also capture the widest audience of learners. So here's an example of our critical care curriculum, one of many uh, that we run throughout the hospital, and this was an adapted lecture series, and you can see here that many of the lectures are complemented by simulation-based training. But when you look in this uh, curriculum in even a little bit more detail, you can see here that this is the way the four-week curriculum unrolls. And what happens is you actually walk the learner through a cold learning cycle. So they have a little bit of reflective experience through a talk. They get some skill sessions, which is a little bit of experiential learning, but it's still very heavy on the conceptual side. They then get a full-fledged simulation, which is not uh, necessarily a code, but it is the ability to take care of a patient uh, who needs some, side, some sort of clinical assistance. They then get a talk, uh, which reinforces the principles from the, um, uh, from the week prior, uh, and then they come in and they have um, kind of a resuscitation mock code that brings it all together. So you can see they kind of walk through the cold learning cycle on a weekly basis and then return uh, back to point number one again on week two. So this is not by some random occurrence. This is a curriculum that's developed specifically to leverage cold learning uh, such that we engage the largest group of learners. And as we all know, even within a single learner, uh, they often share learning styles. And so, yet again, this leverages that most optimally. That's a little brief overview of adult learning. I want to move on to point number two, which is the importance of trained faculty. So why is it important to train faculty? Well, we're true believers of these four statements. It has to do with the high stakes nature of the underlying pedagogy uh, that is very emotionally driven. So this idea of um, of, of short simulations that um, uh, do not engage people in a safe structured environment are really, um, in some ways, um, should be thought about deeply and, and uh, questioned in some ways, because the question is whether we are um, getting the big payoff that we hope for uh, when simulation is used correctly, particularly when we're trying to investigate human factors, versus could we potentially be harmful uh, by um, engaging individuals in emotionally laden experiences without proper uh, debriefing um, to, to, to bring them in for a landing, so to speak, uh, and to leave them uh, both um, informed, but also feel whole at the end of the experience. So we really um, uh, take this quite seriously uh, because of the potential harm that can be done through this particular type of pedagogical tool. The adult learner, we know several things about them from uh, Malcolm Knoll's work and David Kolb, this idea that they want to learn what's practical and useful. They want to use their experience and reflect on new, new knowledge uh, based on their prior experiences. They want to learn at the edge of their learning curve. They want to be included based on the type of learner they are. And they also, we know, journey through multiple emotional states through a curriculum. So keeping track of all of this and being able to navigate the adult learner through this experience, particularly, again, when you're looking at high stakes environments like human factors training, 
you need to be trained adequately to be able to walk them through effectively. And so if you look at the COVE learning cycle specifically, if you, it's really the reflective moment. I'm going to see if I can bring up a pointer here. But it's really this moment that we're trying to fully leverage, right? So they're having an experience, which is the simulation itself. And it's through this reflection and conceptualization, for that matter, that we're going to be able to walk our way through and tag all the bases. So this is a major pivot point in the experience. And you need formal training to be able to do this effectively with a wide audience. This is one program we uh, deliver. Uh, it's an innovations and in pediatric simulation program. It's a three-day instructor course specifically uh, gauged for uh, pediatric and perinatal medicine and perinatal simulation. Uh, and this is just one of several uh, instructor type courses that are available uh, nationally and internationally. Ours just happened to focus specifically on pediatric and perinatal medicine. So we know what the faculty does for the course. They teach it, right? We ask ourselves this question all the time. But what does the course or program do for the faculty? And this is a fundamental question to ask because this is the kind of the core of sustainability for any program. And so this allows me to refer to what we call the course development cycle. And this is an eight step cycle to bring any course online at Children's uh, in simulation. And there are several steps here uh, that you'll see are um, denoted in red. And those are what we call approval steps. So someone will write a proposal akin to a grant application. Um, in fact, many of these proposals move on to grant submission. And once that proposal is done, it's important that they get leadership sign off. And that two things happen at that step. One is that um, their leadership actually signs off and says that the resource will be available, i.e. the human resource will be available to pursue this project. And B, it formally puts the work on the radar of the, uh, of the supervisor or the, uh, uh, the chief or chairman, for that matter. You see that after the retreat, which is when more curriculum development kind of percolates, we ask them again to go back with this revised version that's ready to be launched uh, and get approval again and have a full disclosure and discussion around uh, what's involved in this program's development. And this has been a major boom for our faculty and has really um, increased, A, our faculty coming on board within the program, but also the sustainability of the faculty, because these two key steps and the proposal turning into an actual project become part of their academic promotion. This is true not just for the physicians, but for the nurses and other clinicians throughout the hospital. Uh, and this becomes a win-win for, for them and for their department, because they end up creating very valuable educational materials. So this um, uh, type of thought has been uh, published recently by Kim et al. And I refer you to Simulation in Healthcare, uh, where they talked specifically about the, the program out in Seattle uh, and some of the measures that they took um, in both measuring sustain, uh, faculty retention as well as some of the strategies they used um, in order to uh, optimize that. So I want to talk now about some of these structured processes uh, that I've been uh, referring to. So um, one of them is the simulation teaching cycle. And this is a um, basically a process that we use when we implement courses themselves. And those courses um, are anything from a team training course through essentially a skills training course. Uh, and it starts always with self-preparation. And unless you denote this deliberatively, uh, very often uh, people kind of put courses together in an ad hoc fashion uh, and do not self-prepare uh, appropriately. So we uh, outline specifically what has to happen in that phase. And you can imagine um, if I can get my pointer out here again, you can imagine that the course development cycle is all here in the background prior to the self-preparation. Then we do an introductory phase, and we really emphasize this as a core component of safe structured environment. Uh, this leads to, of course, observations of scenarios, processing around molecules and uh, elements that allow one to formulate questions that become uh, objective, uh, as well as uh, are, are curious and allow us to get at mental models for behavior. And then we engage uh, those particular processed elements within a full-scale uh, full debriefing. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of this type of a cycle. I've talked already about the course development cycle uh, um, as it relates to faculty retention sustainability by building into it uh, and within it uh, forcing functions uh, for, for uh, faculty to uh, become on and stay on the radar of their supervisors and seniors. Uh, but this is the course development cycle that everyone goes through in order to bring a course online. It's eight steps, and it takes anywhere between three and six months uh, for a new course uh, 
to go live, um, depending on the size and complexity of the course itself. But uh, all courses go through this process. We have a series of rubrics that we use, titration rubrics. Uh, here's an example of a content titration rubric uh, related to clinical objectives versus behavioral objectives. And these are then mapped back to the specific expertise of individuals. Uh, and we even have rubrics for uh, actor intensity or prescriptives uh, for actors uh, that allow them to um, engage in a very particular way, uh, depending on uh, various parameters like um, uh, knowledge of the healthcare system, anxiety, uh, stress, uh, even uh, uh, relate their, their, the strength of their relationships, and so on. So we're able to titrate uh, those as well. The team training process uh, itself has a, a process rubric associated with it. And so we use uh, basic CRM uh, as our what we call our 101 team training program. And this can um, take multidisciplinary care providers from multiple disciplines uh, throughout the hospital and bring them together to engage in, in team training. The real goal here um, is, yes, to expose them to particular clinical content. But most importantly, the goal here is to get them used to uh, being in simulators and being debriefed. Uh, getting them off the shallow portion of the learning curve and onto the steep portion so that we can then bring them into what we call our 201 training, which is department-specific or graduate-level training. And here, uh, they already have the exposure to the methodology and the environment, and they can really leverage the experience uh, optimally. Our third uh, level is repetitive deliberative practice. These are the one- or two-hour sessions uh, that occur in various divisions and departments, but only in those who have gone through basic CRM and department-specific training. And the reason for that is because we want to ensure that they understand the safe structure environment in which these trainings are being delivered. And finally, in our 401 courses, we teach them how to debrief. We take them to the other side of the curtain, so we're not debriefing them as much as we're debriefing their ability to debrief each other. If that sounds a little bit nutty, um, it's actually, um, uh, in some ways, uh, the sustainability piece um, uh, incarnate in the sense that um, in some ways we want to be able to back the simulators out uh, and, and allow folks to, to learn from this experience such that they're able to debrief real live events. Uh, and there's lots and lots of in interest in this uh, nationally and internationally in the idea of live video capture. So we're preparing them in that way uh, by going through these four levels of team training. And each of these have a research component attached to them. And finally, the activities of the simulator program itself are very process driven. And so I've touched on each of these um, elements, but you can see that in any particular day, if you were to take a cross section, you'd see that there'd be course development processes going on, faculty development is going on, uh, participant training, research, administration, and even technical work is all going on at different levels and at different phases, depending on the course itself. Um, and so um, with the 70 or so courses that we currently run, uh, with 15 or so in, in process at any particular time, you can see that uh, the cross-section can be um, uh, varied depending on the course and where it is in the cycle. Let's talk about realism a little bit. And so we really adhere to the work of Jen Jenny Rudolph and Dan Raymer in terms of what they published related to the three components of reality, not just technical reality, but the conceptual reality of the scenario and the emotional reality uh, of the uh, contextual environment. And we've really focused a lot on the emotional reality as it relates to point of care training. Bringing people into their own environments really um, gets them 90% of the way there. It's amazing. The technical component of the mannequin itself starts to be less important. And the second thing that's critical for emotional engagement is the native team's involvement. So looking across the bed at a team member that you typically work with. I want to um, blow out a little bit the technical aspect here related to realism. And so we've done lots of work combining uh, sort of collaborative work with our bioengineering group, uh, some industrial engineers, plastics, uh, graphic design, robotics, and software. And we've been able to start to develop specific trainers uh, um, adapted well to pediatric training, particularly as it relates to procedural. So I'll show you an example of our, uh, our trainer that we've used for cannulation training uh, throughout the hospital. This is for ECMO cannulation. And so, uh, let's see if this comes up. So this is the ECMO training uh, uh, trainer, which is embedded within the ECMO mannequin itself. I'm just going to pause it for a minute. You can see that there's an ECMO simulation going on. I apologize for the fuzziness of the slide. 
In the upper right corner in situ, you can see them operating right in the neck of the mannequin, uh, placing cannulas and putting the patient on bypass. <laughs> So that's an ex um, with expansion of our OR team training programs, uh, we've had the need to um, uh, develop more and more of these trainers in pediatrics. Here's an example of the ECMO trainer package that we're now making available more broadly to the pediatric simulation community. It's critical to make this work so that people aren't reinventing wheels, and I think the cannulation trainer in particular has been very uh, uh, popular. Um, in terms of other device development for general surgery, this is a bleeding liver trainer. Uh, that allows you to do full surgeries. Uh, and here is a, a femur fracture trainer for orthopedics. These are all plug and play trainers that can be plugged into currently available mannequins. Uh, and we've done a lot of this work in collaboration uh, with, our, uh, with a company out in uh, Western Massachusetts, the Chamberlain Company, uh, which we've partnered with very closely. For our CT surgeons, I'll bring up a slide if see if this one works. So this is uh, for CT surgery. This is a uh, beating heart trainer that allows CT surgeons to do full sternotomies and allow them to cut down and place these patients on heart-lung bypass. So this is uh, realism for the expert practitioner uh, and allows surgeons to do what they uh, do best and enjoy, which is to, uh, to operate and a dedralist in uh, team training where they otherwise would need to uh, pretend on some level. Let's move on to accessibility, and this has a lot to do with this idea of making simulation part of the institutional fabric uh, of your hospital and institution, and particularly by making it uh, easily accessible to busy clinicians in very busy clinical space. So here's the Children's Hospital of Boston, uh, and you can see it's multiple buildings. Uh, there's the main hospital uh, right here. Uh, there is also uh, health care being delivered in the, uh, in the Farley Pavilion and some portion of the Honeywell uh, and so on. And so it's important that we make simulation available to each of these different uh, buildings and the practitioners that uh, practice within each. And so we've uh, um, uh, adapted uh, multiple delivery modes in order to achieve this. And most of our focus initially was in on-site uh, delivery, but now we're moving into um, a real expansion of in situ uh, as well. I'm including here just an example of some of the benefits and limitations of each of these, but the take-home message is um, it's really a suite of opportunities um, in terms of what uh, you are delivering uh, well adapted to the delivery mode. So one might imagine off-site centers are very good for kind of um, large-scale uh, training where you need lots of space um, and you need to be able to run large groups through that space. It's very hard to do that in on-site centers per se. Uh, unless they, again, have um, lots of square footage. Uh, On-site centers, uh, the beauty here is that you can get um, teams and you can get individuals to this very quickly without having them leave their post uh, for any length of time. And the inside to situate, so this would be a nice example to do some uh, evidence-based medicine training, for example, some protocol training or uh, things that are inherent to your institution. And inside to training, of course, allows for full team involvement at a relatively low cost. Uh, and really allows you to do system programming and integration. And so this is at the highest level in many ways, doing native teams in their native environments. Here's the on-site simulator suite at Children's, and you can see here uh, that it's right there in the ICU. Uh, and we typically on a Friday might round in bed spaces 21 and 22, and then round in the simulator, and then round in bed spaces 24 and 25. So it embeds simulation into the daily work activities. Here's the inside to cart that we published in 2009, and this is a way to very inconspicuously get into point of care environments. We now have three of these that run simultaneously throughout the hospital delivering care to various point of care settings. Uh, the prices are uh, uh, intriguing. Uh, this was the prices uh, for the on-site center that we published in 2005. This is without the mannequin. It was about a quarter of a million US dollars. Uh, when you compare that to in situ simulation, uh, the carts that we developed and published in 2009, along with the blueprints, uh, were costed out at around $8,000 US. Uh, so you can see that you can do get, get simulation started uh, from a technical standpoint uh, with a relatively low cost, low space alternative 
uh, in situ. Here's what we published in terms of numbers. Uh, this is older data, but it's about 40 programs uh, about six years ago. We're up to about 70 now, about 1,600 staff. And the key take home from that was by bringing it on site and in situ, uh, we were able to have usage patterns that were on par to three to 8,000 square foot centers. And at that time, we had about 250 square feet dedicated to simulation. Let's talk about relevancy. And that has to do with aligning your simulator program with the institutional initiatives. And this is, I think, the key pivot point for sustainability. So this is how we think about simulation in the hospital. So our main in initiatives are care, teaching, and research. And so the simulator program is everything um, that happens in the simulation program flows through one of these three major initiatives of the hospital and is either mapped to it uh, or is an implementation arm of one of those particular initiatives through a specific curricula. So we think conceptually the simulator program has to exist in that space. And again, with the ultimate goal of recruiting, recruiting, training, and retaining high quality staff. So here's an example of initiatives that are prescribed by the institution itself, such as best and safest care practices. And here are the CHB simulator program pillars of work and the courses themselves that then feed back to those particular core principles. And so this idea of implementation arm is absolutely key uh, to aligning the program with the institution more broadly. Here it is for family-centered or family-patient-centered care, similar idea and rubric. Here it is for the JACO initiatives or the Joint Commission initiatives uh, for the hospital. We have multiple courses that reinforce each of the eight uh, initiatives, again, becoming a uh, critical component and resource for the hospital itself. Even our risk management foundation, uh, we've been able to partner well with them. Uh, so this is our insurance carrier for the hospital. Uh, and they identified that of the claims that come to them, uh, they represent just a small portion of the adverse events or near misses uh, that exist below the surface. And when they looked at the data in, in surgery in particular, they saw that equal to technical skills was communication errors in the cases that came to fruition uh, as a risk management case. So they became very interested in developing programs in order to address this element particularly, and those processes or, or, or programs uh, ultimately came to simulation. And so we partnered very closely with risk management and have developed simulation-based training programs for our surgical teams in order to directly address communication issues in the operating room as a major source of morbidity and mortality. Here's an example of our orthopedics program. You'll see the femur fracture trainer uh, in play here. What do you guys say? So we're down, we got the practice closed, we got one vessel. What do you guys say? So we're down, we got the practice closed, we got one vessel. We cannot see a source, but it is losing the pretty good thing. A product like this where the reality is very high, the authenticity is high, the trainers are there for them to operate on, you start to get real engagement of that level uh, of provider. I want to talk briefly about um, the collaborative nature of the program. I like to say that the simulator program is formed conceptually as a centralized resource with a somewhat decentralized <clears throat> footprint. Uh, in order to be here in the hospital, uh, we've had to um, create a footprint that is uh, delivered or dispersed uh, throughout the hospital, either in the form of in situ carts, but also in the form of satellite elements uh, that exists throughout the hospital that, in which uh, simulation-based activities are occurring. Uh, but despite the fact that this is relatively decentralized in its footprint, there is certainly a community that is formed here of educators that identify themselves with simulation-based training. Part of this had to do with the fact that we paid close attention as we grew the program to making sure that we stayed proportional to uh, the multidisciplinary nature uh, of the cl clinical um, uh, environment. And so as you can see here, as we grew, we were able to stay uh, with similar percentages of nursing and physician input uh, in terms of the training, both from the standpoint of faculty as well as uh, from the standpoint of participants. So I showed you the growth. Here's an example about, this is about two or three year old data when we were around 51 courses, but you can see that faculty and facilitators come from pretty much all the divisions and departments of the hospital. 
And in particular, they represent multidisciplinary faculty. For every team training program, uh, there is a core group of facilitators that represent uh, each of the subspecialties that uh, represent that make up the participant pool, so to speak. And so there's a high emphasis on multidisciplinary involvement, both from uh, really from design through implementation. We also standardize and collaboratively form most of the other major elements of the program. For example, team training. All of the team training programs are based on a standardized backbone that was created collaboratively. It's an off-the-shelf model or a turnkey solution, and it allows us to create team training programs relatively rapidly, and as a result, create a common language of teamwork uh, throughout the hospital, which is very attractive to senior stakeholders. The briefing among colleagues is another collaborative effort, uh, which has its own unique challenges, but we believe very strong benefits. And one might argue that the briefing among one's colleagues, as opposed to um, having uh, participants um, work within a center where the, the debriefers are, are not uh, from their practice, for example, um, may, um, may not be as, uh, as effective uh, in the sense that um, it's really partners of a similar practice who would be talking to each other and talking about what works well for their practice and what they might want to improve. We've come up with various strategies in order to achieve this. Some of it is the co-debriefer model where we have, for example, in our surgical programs, different surgical subspecialties co-debriefing each other. So, so CT surgery and general surgery partner, and during the CT surgery simulations, general surgery helps as a co-debriefer, and the vice versa is true as well. Orthopedics and otolaryngology uh, co-debrief together. Uh, so for our orthopedic programs, a otolaryngologist serves as a co-debriefer um, to be an outsider in terms of the practice, but an insider in terms of surgery. And so we create these gradients of clinical experts with relatively non-clinical participants or partners in the debriefing practice, and we've had wonderful results. Faculty development itself is a very collaborative component. Um, all of our faculty go through a three-day mandatory course of simulation and debriefing. They go through a refresher course or booster training, uh, and they receive feedback throughout the year. Uh, they all engage within the course development cycle, and they all are part of a larger sim users group which has biannual meetings, journal clubs, and invited speakers. And all of this really engages them as community members. Finally, uh, in closing, I just want to talk about how one might think about research and simulation uh, in improving and uh, studying the process of it itself. And it relates to the work of Clayton Christensen uh, or disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation, in a nutshell, are innovations that are drivers of failure for good companies, but a source of new growth opportunities for those that are successful. And I highly recommend uh, any of these books that I've listed here, but particularly The Innovator's Prescription and The Innovator's Dilemma talk about and define disruptive technology. As an example, you could think about computers. Uh, you could think about the way computers were in the 1970s and 80s, and they were just increasing in terms of their technology uh, and their performance over time. But at some point, uh, they overshot the current demand of the market, and, and many people didn't need large mainframes that took up entire rooms, but instead they really needed things that could fall on their desk. And that created the disruptive technology of PC computers. And we all know what happened there. A new market uh, created was created that even PC computers started to overperform, and people wanted laptop capabilities uh, and created that disruptive technology. And the story, of course, continues to the RIM technology or iOS type technology you might have in your pocket, which is the ultimate in portability, but a far cry uh, from where we were in terms of the size and scope um, many, many years ago. So the question is, if a disruptive technology is one that is cheaper, simpler, smaller, more convenient to use, underperforms established products, but is good enough and expands the audience and customers, is not simulation a disruptive innovation in that way? And should we also be thinking about simulation in terms of its adoption, but also its study in similar ways? So Clayton Christensen talks about the three levels of healthcare in many ways, problem solving, protocols and patterns, and then kind of binary medicine, such as uh, cultures and sensitivities, or even uh, pregnancy tests for that matter. And the idea of a simulation program is that it can assist and accelerate and support learned skills at each of these levels, uh, but in addition, should also be performing research to study the process and in some ways uh, sort of um, anticipate the next disruption within the, the field itself. 
And you can imagine looking at it at the level of problem solving, protocols and patterns, or even at the rules-based level of simulation-based applications of the methodology. And there's lots of good work now being done looking at CRM principles, for example, uh, coding and, and, uh, and uh, uh, techniques. Uh, some of the work I showed you in developing task trainers is starting to look at ways of enhancing the field from the standpoint of what are the simulators we should be using now and what are the next generation of simulators. And even work calibrating the tool. There's lots of work coming out now looking at stress response during simulation-based training. Here's an example from David Cook, which really brings it all together. He did a wonderful a meta-analysis of technology-enhanced simulation, both at the level of skills training as well as in patient outcomes. This was a wonderful paper that showed uh, nice effects both in both of those realms uh, and very supportive of simulation-based training. This was a, a real sentinel paper. Here's the paper by uh, Diane Wayne looking at bloodstream infections, uh, again, at that higher level uh, of, of, uh, of application. And you can see here they also showed uh, simulation-based uh, intervention having large effects on both bloodstream infections as well as in cost-benefit analysis. So in summary, um, as, we've, as I've mentioned, I think these are the, what we've found at least over the last 10 years to be the eight sort of basic tools that we have in our kit and the ones that we adhere to most strongly as we continue to develop and, uh, and uh, widen the program. It has to be applicable and related to adult learning principles. It has to be high quality, and that's really all about the faculty. It has to be structured, and I've showed you some of the processes that we've implemented. It has to be realistic, uh, and I've shown you some examples of some trainers, but also emphasize the importance of emotional reality, which is pretty uh, cheap in many ways in terms of cost, and it really has to do with native environments and native teams. It has to be accessible to busy clinicians in busy hospitals and during busy work days. It has to be relevant in some ways, as I mentioned, the implementation arm of major hospital initiatives. Collaborative, I showed you some examples and strategies to create communities of learning around simulation. And it has to study and improve its own processes. Um, and I showed you some uh, sort of a conceptual framework around that for us to be conscious of the idea uh, that simulation in many ways is a, in a positive way is a disruptive technology in healthcare, and we should be thinking about it in those terms. And the goal really is to develop a professional organization, which is your simulation program, within a professional organization, which is your institution or hospital. And we've been delighted to actually start to test this, and I mentioned earlier some of our international work, so we've taken these very pieces or toolkits and have applied them in various centers around the globe. Most recently, we're working in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, partnering with the Starship Hospital and some others uh, in Europe and, and, and in the States as well. And it's been exciting to see the transferability of many of these uh, tools uh, within various cultural contexts. So I want to thank you all for your attention uh, and thank again Mark and Taylor uh, for the opportunity to speak and I'd be happy to answer any questions.